Hello, it's Lewis here, and I'd like to talk about some of the main mistakes that students made last year, so hopefully you don't repeat the same things in your exams this summer. I met up with some of the people who work at OCR last week, and they gave me this document here, which you can actually find on their website. They rather optimistically call it the 2019 Summer Highlights. They're not really highlights, they're more the things that people did badly wrong. And I thought in this video I could go over some of the main points, and even though this is written about the OCR exams, Everything I'm going to talk about is really applicable for anybody doing A-level physics and actually anybody doing A-level or even GCSE exams. Now don't forget that you can subscribe to my YouTube channel which is Physics Online where I'll be having a lot more videos and live streams to really help you prepare for your exams. And also if you're looking at A-level physics I've got alevelphysicsonline.com where I've got every video organised by exam board and topic so have a look over there and that will really help you prepare. But first of all what I'm going to do is start with some of the main mistakes that people made in their exam technique. So this is really important because sometimes you just need to get one or two extra marks every few questions to really increase your grade and actually maybe go up a grade boundary. So what were the mistakes that people made last year? First of all, let's look at these long answer questions. Um, this is something that I know a lot of people really struggle with because it's not a nice calculation where there's a clear start and end point. So what they said was that if students were, at, were to actually underline some of the keywords in the question, that would really help the students focus in on what they had to answer. But also when it comes to answering, you can be concise. Sometimes people think that if you fill up the whole space with lots and lots of writing, the more you write, the more chance you've got of getting the correct mark. That isn't always the case. Sometimes, and I've seen it so many times, where students keep writing and writing and writing, and then they start to contradict what they said earlier, and that means they might have they might actually lose any marks they originally gained. And don't forget as well that you can always write in bullet points. Sometimes if you structure the bullet points uh, in an appropriate format, that really helps the person reading your answer to actually see that you understand the physics. Now you still need to use uh, the correct terminology, you need to use the correct scientific language, but a lot of the times doing bullet points really helps you structure your answer. The next point was about multiple choice questions, which you might have in your exam. Now the best way to get really good at multiple choice questions is just to have a better, deeper understanding of physics. But a lot of the time, and I've seen this when I've been marking students' work, even after however many years of schooling, people still don't even choose an option. They sometimes leave a multiple qu choice question blank. If you don't know, you need to guess. Maybe C is a good approach. Uh, people tend to prefer B or C. But it's not always a one in four chance. It might be that there's two answers which you know are definitely wrong. So what you can do in the paper is just cross through the answers that you know are definitely incorrect. And then maybe rather than having a 25% chance of getting the correct answer, you might go to a 50% chance of getting the correct answer. Do not leave them blank because that's just easy marks that you could be throwing away. Now the next bit of advice is something that your teachers will have tried to drum into you and then you just ignore. Always show you're working out, even for the simple calculations. It doesn't take long to do, but it does mean that if you make a mistake somehow, perhaps you forget to put in a zero or you're dividing rather than timesing, at least the people marking your work can see your approach to that question. And okay, you might not get the final answer correct, but you might get three out of the four marks because you showed you're working out. You will make mistakes, you're gonna be up against the time pressure, it's a little bit stressful, it's a different environment. And it's a shame to maybe lose four marks when actually you might only lose one mark um, just by not showing that working out. So make sure you show that. Also, when it comes to working out uh, your answers, and especially if you've got a multiple step calculation, make sure that you don't round down too early. I would, my advice would be that you keep the numbers in your calculator. You maybe write down the full calculator display, so maybe eight uh, figures that you've got in your working out, and only um, make, actually make your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures at the final stage of that calculation. So if you've been given raw data to two significant figures, your final answer should be to two. If it's been given to three, give your final answer to three. And that just means that rather than rounding down too early, you round down at the very end. Now the next bit of advice is about graphs, and even though this is based on 17 and 18 year old intelligent students, the advice that uh, the exam boards have to give is really more applicable to 11 year olds, people who've just started secondary school. So for example, make sure that when you do a line of best fit, you have a, an approximately the same amount of points above and below the line. And also sometimes that line of best fit might be a curved line rather than a straight line. And when you do draw in a straight line, 
don't force it to go into the origin if that's not where it needs to go. Sometimes you will have an intercept with the y-axis, but don't try and just force that straight line into the origin every single time. If you do have a straight line and you need to work out the gradient, what a lot of students were doing was they were just kind of showing some calculations. They didn't show how they actually calculated that gradient. My top tip, it would be just to use a pencil or even just a pen to draw on a large triangle over as much of that straight line as possible. Not a tiny little one, but a nice large triangle. You can then read off your coordinates from the line. Okay, not from the data points, but from the line where you've actually drawn that pencil line onto it. You can then do your uh, dy by dx to actually work out the gradient. Now, the next thing about graphs um, is really more specific to some of the kind of, the, I suppose, the actual physics graphs that you need to know about. Now, impulse graphs are quite important. Um, this often happens when you've got a collision. So perhaps it might be a hockey ball and a hockey stick. When you get a collision, it happens for a very, very short amount of time, but we have quite high forces involved. So what you might see then is a graph that looks like this. And in order to work out the change in momentum of that object, you need to look at the area underneath that force time graph. Now, in all, the best way to work at the area is either by approximating, by using uh, triangles and rectangles, and then you can just quickly work out the area. Sometimes they want you to count squares. It's just like a quick way of doing things. But it's really important to pay attention to what is actually labelled on the axis. If you've got an impulse graph, we often have kilonewtons and we have milliseconds. Okay, now luckily, because you've got a 10 to the 3 times a 10 to the minus 3, those kind of units kind of basically make 1. So that means you can just work out the area using these units to actually work out the change in momentum. But every time you're looking at graphs, just play really, pay really, really close attention to what the axis are labelled with. And actually, why not include that in your answer as well? Uh, something else that uh, students struggle with, uh, and this is maybe more of an OCR-specific question for the 2019 papers, um, was looking at the work done when something is extended. And what it said was that if you have maybe a spring that's extended, um, the reason that there's energy stored is because as I'm applying a force downwards, that force is overcoming the tension holding this, and we're doing, applying a force over a distance, and therefore we're doing work on the spring, which is now resulting in energy stored by this thing. Again, there's going to be only so many graphs that you need to know about. There's definitely common ones that you'll see in your textbook. So why not just make um, one big A3 sheet that shows all the graphs that you need to know? Maybe some of uh, what things represent. So does the gradient represent something? Does the area under the line represent something? Have it on one A3 piece of paper, and that will really help you when it comes to your revision. Now, a real advantage of A-level physics is that you get a massive data sheet that has loads of data on it and also loads of equations, so you don't actually have to remember them all. But it's worth having a look at this before the exam so that you know which constants are on there. And, you know, you don't need to remember some of these numbers because they are given to you and they're the values that you should use in your calculations. I suppose the downside is that a lot of the equations they give you, they just have the symbols. So this one here might be hf equals phi plus ke max. Do you know what H and F actually represent in this case? Do you know what this phi stands for in this context? Because sometimes we use the same symbol in maybe another part of the course. So although they might give you the equations, you've still got to remember what everything stands for, for all the equations for the specification that you're doing. Hopefully, though, uh, the more practice you do, the more familiar you'll get with actually using the equations and therefore going back to your data book to actually find out the values you need. So have a data book with you like a physical hard copy every time you're doing your past papers. Now, based on the 2019 papers, OCR produced the following advice. Again, this is going to be useful for everyone doing A-level physics. The first one was about equations involving internal resistance. Now, personally, I don't like these equations. I like it when the circuit all works perfectly. But there's obviously a required practical that you might need to know about where you look at measuring the internal resistance of a cell, maybe plotting the graph and seeing what the gradient and the intercept actually represent. And then I suppose there's often kind of tr quite tricky questions where you're actually using this internal resistance uh, and actually have to account for that in your calculations. So I suppose what they really said was don't forget about little r. The next one they talked about was about Kirchhoff's first and second laws. So here we have our very simple circuit. We've got a source of EMF here. We've got two resistors. Now, you need to know what Kirchhoff's first law is, and that's about how the sum of the currents into a junction is equal to the sum of the currents out of the junction. So effectively, whatever current comes in here, 
some of it's going to go that way, some of it's going to go that way. So the current splits here, and then it kind of joins together up here. And that's really due to the fact that charge is conserved. Whatever charge goes in, the same charge goes out. So Kirchhoff's first law is about conservation of charge. Kirchhoff's second law is really about the conservation of energy. Remember that energy can't be created or destroyed. So Kirchhoff's second law basically says that around any closed loop in the circuit, the sum of the EMFs is going to be the same as the sum of the potential differences. So if that's a 2 volt cell, then there's going to be 2 volts across this and 2 volts across that as well. So Kirchhoff's second law is really the fact that energy can, cannot be destroyed, cannot be created or destroyed. Okay. The next one, and I suppose this kind of goes nicely onto the, the work, I suppose, about the fact that charge is conserved, is actually looking at equations where we have maybe beta minus or even beta plus emission. When it comes to balancing these nuclear reactions, you've got to have an understanding about what's actually happening inside the nucleus. So if this is a nucleus of some atom, and we're uh, having a beta minus, so that's our high-speed electron, um, emitted from the unstable nucleus, well, we must conserve charge. And so what happens is a neutron turns into a proton and an electron, therefore charge is conserved. But because we have to conserve lepton number, and we've created a lepton in this high-speed electron, we must also have an anti-lepton, which is an anti-electron neutrino. And we always show that with a bar, just a kind of horizontal line above the antimatter particles. That comes up all the time, so if there's one or two nuclear equations you need to know about, I would definitely say that the beta minus and beta plus emissions are the, one that you, the ones you just have to know. But going one stage bigger, uh, sometimes you have a massive nucleus, and what happens here is that under the, the right conditions we can get nuclear fission occurring. Remember, this is when a nucleus, not the atom, but it's the nucleus of a heavy isotope splits apart, often caused when um, it absorbs a neutron, so this is my red neutron here, this now becomes unstable. And when it becomes unstable, it splits into a couple of daughter nuclei. So these things here kind of uh, come shooting off. But also, and this is really important, is we often have the emission of neutrons. And that was often forgotten about, the fact that a neutron comes in, yes, it splits into two smaller things, but it also gives two or three or even four neutrons, which then can go on to cause further fission reactions. Students were often also unclear about actually what happens inside that fission reactor. You know, what are the control rods actually used for? What's the moderator for? So just as a, a bit of a summary, what you have in the reactor is you have uranium fuel rods. It actually comes into like small pellets which go into these fuel rods and these can be sort of dropped down into the reactor then taken up and exchanged. So there's a huge amount of these fuel rods which have um, the right type of uranium, the kind of fissionable uranium. But then inside this we have control rods which go up and down. Now the whole point in the control rods is to control the rate of reaction. If the reaction is uh, happening where maybe one event causes more than one event, then that means the reaction is starting to speed up, so they might put the control rods down. And what the control rods are doing is actually absorbing the excess neutrons. Okay. Now, if you want the reaction to go a bit quicker, you take the control rods out, and that means less of these neutrons are being absorbed. So the control rods basically control that rate of reaction. The moderator is something different. Now, this reactor here... Uh, is based on a pressurised water reactor, and actually this uses water as the moderator. Now what the water is designed to do is that when the neutrons come through it, rather than being absorbed and stopped, it just slows them down. So this means that the fast neutrons are now made into slower neutrons, and that's what is actually needed by the uranium nu nucleus to actually absorb. So it takes the really fast neutrons, it absorbs some of their energy, it slows them down, it moderates their speed, and that means these are now uh, thermal neutrons which can cause another fission. And again, um, we also have some kind of coolant, often water, could be CO2, and the coolant is pumped around this, it then um, heats up, it goes to a heat exchanger, which causes water to heat up, turn into steam, to then uh, cause turbines to move, to cause generators to then start generating electricity. So you have to be familiar with um, not a specific reactor, but the role of the different parts inside nuclear fission reactors. The next point is illustrated with a dolphin in this guide. 
Uh, it took me ages to find a dolphin. I don't know why they chose that. Perhaps it's a dead one just floating in the water. Anyway, basically, first of all, if it's in equilibrium, that means there's no resultant force on it. The force down is equal to the force up. The force to the left is equal to the force to the right. But what a lot of people forgot about was actually talking about that there's going to be no resultant moment. So any clockwise moments are equal to the anti-clockwise moments. So objects in equilibrium, it's not just about the forces, it's about there's no resultant moment on that object either. The next point, we're going to keep going with the dolphin theme here, was about the weight of an object and how that relates to Newton's third law, and in particular the force pairings that we get. Now, if you've got a dolphin, um, there's a weight acting down, and this is caused by the Earth attracting the dolphin due to the gravitational force. Newton's third law says that there's basically going to be an equal and opposite force of the same type. So just as much as the Earth is pulling down on the dolphin, the dolphin is pulling up on the Earth with the same amount. Now, the size of the force is the same, though in opposite directions, but I guess in reality the real effect is that because this has got such a bigger mass, and F equals ma, then um, when it accelerates up to meet the dolphin, it's going to be a very, very small acceleration because this mass is so big. Whereas if you drop a dolphin, it will just then hit the ground as this is accelerated towards that larger mass. So Newton's third law, it's always worth having um, a refresher just to basically look at the definition and also start practicing applying that to real life situations. So I've only got three points remaining now. The next one is so basic that I can't believe people made that mistake, but you know, these things happen is looking at the angle of incidence and refraction. Remembering, of course, that, and if you do have a diagram, draw on a normal line at 90 degrees to the surface. You can then measure your angle of incidence or your angle of refraction or reflection between the normal line and the ray of light that we're looking at. This is really important when it comes to doing uh, calculations of the Snell's law, looking at uh, optical fibers and total internal reflection. I suppose on a similar theme, so not so much about you maybe measuring the angle in degrees, is that when it comes to calculations on your calculator, always check if you're going to be using the degrees or radians mode. If you're doing calculations for SHM, so simple harmonic motion, um, make sure that you use radians if you're doing things with 2 pi. So I would say degrees for anything to do with angles of light, but always use radians when it comes to looking at simple harmonic and often circular motion as well. Again, the more practice you do, you'll just get into good habits and therefore you'll start to realise if your answers look completely wrong because you've forgotten to change your calculator. And the final thing is really to do with combining uncertainties. You've got some measured quantities um, and if you want to look at the total uncertainty, then what we do is we combine all of the uncertainties that made it up. So in this case here, uh, if y equals a times b or y equals a over b, because you've got the uncertainty in the A and the uncertainty in B, the way that we get around this is we just add those individual uncertainties together. If you've got Y equals A squared, then all we're doing is we have, effectively this is the same as Y equals A A, and therefore you just add the uncertainty in A to the uncertainty in A. If you had Y equals A squared B, you'd have A plus A plus B. Every time you see that term in some equation, you just keep adding that on. And this just gives us a rough idea of the total uncertainty. Anyway, hopefully a lot of that stuff I've just talked about, you don't need to know about because you are working hard and you identify that there are things that you probably would never make a mistake about. There will be questions this year for whichever exam board that are going to seem unfamiliar. But if you just think about it, about having good exam technique, about thinking about some of your basic skills in terms of drawing diagrams, writing out your equations, you are far less likely to make mistakes. And it might just be these one or two marks that you gain on each paper that maybe just push you up to that next grade boundary. Anyway, if you'd like to see, you know, see a lot more stuff that I've done, have a look at alevelphysicsonline.com. I've got over 500 videos for A-Level Physics. Um, so make sure that you're not only subscribed to me on YouTube, but also you can get a full subscription for less than £20, or your schools can get subscriptions so you can see everything that I've done, which I'm doing to help you do better in your exam. So make sure you subscribe there. And um, apart from that, uh, keep watching videos, keep working hard, and I'm sure that you're going to do really, really well in your exams that are coming up this summer. Thank you.